Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club. Herbicides and fungicides and pesticides are old. The veggies you are growing in your garden start to mold. If the ants are attacking and you're having a hard time, call Montana Egg Live. Now we in the ditch and the old bull's got a itch. Takes upon my sheep and the wool is really cheap. The gophers in the pasture are even worse than last year. Montana Egg Live, where are you? Good evening and welcome to Montana Ag Live, coming to you from the beautiful studio at Montana State University. Um, we are a PBS program. Uh, this is a call-in program, so you guys get the opportunity to drive the agenda of our program. We've assembled a great panel of experts today. We have Mary Burroughs, who is our extension plant pathologist. Um, she works with small grains and is also overseeing the pulse diagnostic lab. So anything in that realm, um, shoot it towards her. Also, any garden diseases, things like that. Um, Anton Beckerman is our special guest today. Um, he is an ag economist specializing in agricultural trade issues, and he is currently serving as the associate director of the Montana Ag Experiment Station. So you can ask him questions about both of those jobs. Um, Lori Kurzinik is our um, extension insect ID person, and um, as you know, um, and she won't disappoint you today, she'll have some great show and tells and talk to us about um, insect problems. Um, Toby day our extension horticulturalist everything yard garden um, get, can give that to Toby and I am director of the um, Montana seed potato program so any potato questions that you have for me um, please feel free um, our uh, our phone panel today is Cheryl Morgoff Cheryl Bennett and Don Mathry so please get those phones ringing and get those questions in so first uh, we'll go back to Anton and Anton, uh, can you talk to us a little bit um, both about your position at MSU and Ag Econ and then also with the Ag Experiment Station? Sure, uh, thanks, yeah. So I'm, I'm in the Agricultural Economics and Economics Department, that's my home department. Uh, I've been there about 10 years. Uh, my research focuses on marketing issues. So why do prices do what they do? How, you know, why do they go up? Why do they become more volatile? Why do they, you know, why do producers decide to sell to some grain elevators, not others? Uh, I, I look particularly at grain markets. And so trade, of course, which is one of the bigger issues uh, on the docket recently, is certainly a part of, of that research. And recently, uh, in July, I was appointed the Associate Director of the Agricultural Experiment Station here in Montana. And and uh, that, that's a very exciting job for me. It's, it's uh, particularly looking at the day-to-day -day operations of, of the Ag Experiment Station, which is, it, it facilitates all of the publicly funded agricultural research here in the state. And, and so uh, it's, it's very exciting to help facilitate the research that goes here at Montana State and all around the state, as well as uh, getting that research to stakeholders and bringing ideas from stakeholders back to Montana's researchers so we can help solve some of the more important problems in the state. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Um, so Mary, this is a question that came in from Glasgow. Um, this person is interested in two new crops that um, are gaining interest in Montana, hemp and teff. Um, first of all, could you explain a little bit about what those crops are and what they're used for? And then what diseases might they expect on these new crops? So those are two of what we call minor crops that are below a certain acreage. 
Um, and so I'm the IR4 coordinator for the state and we work for pesticide applications on minor crops. Most of our requests tend to be herbicides. <laughs> and once you can grow the crop, um, then we'll, af after you get enough acres, you tend to get more diseases and insects. So right now, nothing as far as I know. Hemp is industrial hemp for oil and fiber, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and then teff is generally in Montana uh, forage crop. But in like Nevada, they'll grow it to seed and they make a, a spongy bread. Um, is it Ethiopian bread? Yeah. So, oh, yeah. Okay. Really what's, what's, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I was just curious what family Teff, I've never even heard of this before. I have no idea. And is every time grass? I look for it on the research station, they say it didn't emerge. Mm. <laughs> so is it a cereal or is it a, a dicot? I, 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 it, 2,4-D works on it, I think. Oh, okay, so it must be a dicot. It's a, some, sort, some sort of um, grass, but um, yeah, I don't, I don't know a lot about it. Okay. Um, I know one grower had some problems with lentil this year and he replaced it with Teff and seeded it in mid-July. Oh, so okay. it's a warm season for us forage crop. Okay, very good. Um, Toby from Cut Bank, how and when do you plant current bushes? When do you plant them? Um, so currants, uh, you can purchase any time they're in the pot. Uh, right now, fall is a good time to plant them. Um, and uh, as is many of our shrubs, uh, if you if you get them in a pot. Uh, if you get them bare root, you're not going to find those until spring. And a follow-up question. Mm -hmm. When's the best time to prune them, and how do you prune them? Uh, the best time to prune them, prune them is, is the same time you'd prune your apple trees or any other. Uh, it's usually late winter, early spring. You can prune them any time. Uh, currants, flower, and fruit on second and third year w uh, wood. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to prune anything that's new. Uh, and if it's really old and woody and decadent, that's what you want to prune out so you can let those new canes produce more, more fruit. But again, they, kinda, they, they produce fruit on the two and three year old wood. So it's kind of hard to figure out what that is. Uh, usually if it's really decadent, that's when you want to prune it out. Okay. Right to the ground. Oh, okay, great. Okay, Lori from Billings. Um, what is the status of emerald ash borer in the state? Uh, emerald ash borer it is a, a wood boring beetle that's uh, it's it hasn't made it to Montana yet or hasn't been detected yet in Montana. So we are very actively looking for the emerald ash borer. It is I think now in 33 states, so it is it is spreading. It's in North Dakota, isn't it? Uh, I can't remember if it's in North Dakota, Dakota or not. Uh -huh. But but yeah, it's it's a it's a pest that spreads pretty easily through human transport. So um, the 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 times the, the closest to us is I think Boulder, Colorado, and and they think that that that, that it showed up maybe through pallets, oh, and, okay. and and also um, it it jumps around quite a bit, and and so I think uh, firewood and and pallets and things like that are, are ways that that um, you know gets transported, but. We are we are trying to look for it. So if you think uh, we have a lot of dieback on our on our ashes, so a lot mm -hmm. of things mimic the emerald ash borer. But you can always send me some pictures too if you if you're concerned. But um, but yeah, to date we haven't detected it anywhere in Montana. Yeah, I know people in Bozeman are always nervous because ash is kind of our predominant um, boulevard tree, especially yeah, oh, in yeah. the older areas of town. So. If yeah, anything I've were to often, happen, it would be really serious business. I've often said as soon as we get to Emerald Ashbore in Bozeman, the first thing that's going to show up in front of my house is a for sale sign. Because <laughs> Yeah. You lose 80% of your street uh -huh. trees in Bozeman, and it's not going to be that cool place that hits all the magazines anymore. Uh, right. So it's a big deal. Um, I know that the city of Bozeman and also mun other municipalities are are doing things about it, and I know that Laurie's been working a lot on that. So that's, that's it's a good thing that we were out there. Yeah, the surveillance is very important. What are ways to prevent it or, or manage it? Are, are there any? Well, uh, what we recommend now is just to keep your trees really healthy. Yeah. So if they're healthy enough to receive a systemic insecticide that's received through the root system, then 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 that your trees will be able. They can be treated even when it arrives. But uh, we just in, in in areas where it is it is present, uh, the extension entomologist uh, recommend treatment only when it's within about 30 miles of your, uh, 30 mm -hmm. mile radius because the, the treatments that they have available right now are so effective that once it is detected within a certain range. Then, then you could definitely save your trees. Keep your trees healthy, and then think about some alternative trees. And, and never bring in firewood from an area that has exactly. <laughs> emerald ash borer issues. Yep. So, great. Okay, Anton from Glasgow, um, can you update us on Montana's wheat market? Yeah, uh, it's. So the, the the key word is is uncertainty, uh, and and I think that that's been a lot uh, tied to the the, the global 
uh, trade negotiations that the United States uh, is currently in. Uh, there's been we've had a very good year uh, after last year, which was very. Uh, uh, very much affected by drought this year. We've had a very good production year, especially in spring wheat. Uh, so very uh, high productivity in the high quality spring wheat. We have a lot of protein out there, uh, which is great for exporting that high protein wheat to other markets. So uh, I think uh, that that bodes well for Montana. But in general, I think there's a lot of uncertainty in pricing around the world. There's a lot of uncertainty about what Russia, who is the top world exporter, what they're going to do. They're still uh, debating whether to close some of their exports. And if they do, then you could expect Montana and U.S. wheat mm -hmm. prices to go up. If they decide not to close their exports, uh, we can see probably a, a similar price remaining through, throughout the marketing year. Uh, so it's uh, there's still some, some things to kind of work out in the global wheat production sphere, but mm -hmm. things are looking either sideways or, or up for, for Montana wheat markets. Okay, very good. Um, Mary from uh, Richland, their pea seed looks like it has baseball-like lines on it, so I guess they're looking really close and they see some, some lines on the seed. Do you have any idea what's causing that? It's highly likely to be pea seed-borne mosaic virus, mm -hmm. which is a seed-transmitted virus, and it's also spread by aphids, and we have had some reports of it in the northeast Montana. So it, it can be important. Um, they can sure call us and get a seed test. Okay, so that seed, is it likely to germinate and produce a diseased plant the next year or is it, it kind of self-eliminating? It, it depends on the variety. So there's some varieties that will transmit at like 60% rate, but most of them are much, much lower than that. Mm -hmm. um, right now, if you do have a positive test, we just recommend you get rid of the seed and you know feed it or something because we don't want to perpetuate the problem. Okay. Um, from Belt, Toby, is it possible to transplant quaking aspen on their property and what's the best way to do it? So they have a uh, quaking aspen on their property? It I would assume like maybe yeah. they're thinking about transplanting some of the suckers? Yeah, so um, first of all, I don't usually recommend that because uh, you can bring, especially if you bring it into an uh, urban type situation, a lot of the old uh, stands of aspen have disease issues and insect issues, so you could be bringing that mm -hmm. into an urban situation. However, uh, if you just want to transplant them to move some of those seedlings around to start new, uh, new quaking aspen groves, you want to do that after the leaves have fallen um, this year, if you can get it into the ground, uh, so very soon now, um, that way the plant is completely dormant. Either that or first thing in the spring before it buds out. So those are gonna be the two best times to try to do that. When you do uh, move those in the, in the fall, you, you, you can treat them kind of like a bare root plant. If you move them in the spring, you wanna get the biggest root ball you can with mm -hmm. them. So uh, there's kind of two ways to look at it. Actually, fall's probably the best time. Okay, great. Um, this is a question that actually came in on potatoes, so I will answer it. It's from <laughs> Bozeman. Um, this person is wondering where they can buy large baking potatoes that are locally grown and don't have scab or other skin lesions. Um, so what I can tell you is right now our potato producers are harvesting. Some of them are actually done, the lucky ones. Some of them are going to be fighting with some mud and a little bit of frost. But after they're done with their harvest, what they will be doing is um, grading off the potatoes that are too large to sell for seed potatoes. And a lot of those do end up in our locally owned grocery stores. So after about the middle of November, take a look in our locally owned grocery stores and you should probably see some nice large baking potatoes showing up. How big is a potato that you want to plant for seed potato? The optimal size for seed potatoes is six to eight ounces. Hmm. And um, you can have a certain amount in the 10 to 12 ounce range, but once you get over 12 ounces, those are definitely considered oversized and those do need to be graded off. Well, I didn't know that. Yeah. So. So yeah, but they make wonderful baking potatoes, and if you're making mashed potatoes, it's a lot less to peel. So <laughs> <laughs> I really like those uh, those baking potatoes. So, so Lori from Hamilton, um, they have a snowball bush, and the aphids are attacking it. What is the best treatment, and when should the treatment be applied? Uh, if it's a snowball, the, I think those aphids are uh, are leaf. They they cause some leaf curling. So the best time to to 
actually apply anything uh, would be in the in the spring before the leaf curling happens if you're going to do a contact insecticide. Uh, otherwise, you could probably do a, a, a systemic kind of early in the spring as well. But um, the, those the snowball bushes could get really curled, and they also have um, they they tend to get areified mites, which are small microscopic mite that I'll talk about in a little bit too with the sample. But th they also will turn. Um, Part of the snowball a little purplish too, but but the aphids could get could cause some really bad curling there. But spring, so okay, yep. great. Um, Anton, this is a question that just came in from Lewistown. Is the government planning any new cheese programs as they have in the past? Do you know anything about cheese programs? Uh, I'm I'm less familiar about cheese. Uh, I do know that. The uh, new trade agreement uh, between the United States, Mexico, and Canada that has been signed by the three leaders uh, of the three countries uh, but is yet to be approved by Congress uh, has definitely worked to um, prop up the dairy program and, and create inroads for marketing dairy to Canada. Um, so part of that could include some of the cheese uh, production. Uh, and I know that with, with, the, uh, with the farm bill, that's the 2018, but, but we'll see what happens in the, in, in the next several months, wh whether it's going to be 2018 or potentially be actually passed in 2019. Uh, there are going to be some changes that are still ongoing with the dairy program. Uh, th that could also include cheese. Uh, that's again with those two pieces of legislation still up in the air. Uh, it's I don't want to comment on anything because th there's still quite a bit of uncertainty. Sure. Yeah. One of the things that I've heard recently is that with milk surpluses, mm -hmm. um, cheese producers that tend to produce a lot more cheese, so that we actually do have a really big cheese surplus, hmm. which is kind of interesting, and I've actually noticed some great sales <laughs> on cheese lately. So, And, and, and one of the things that, uh, with this, uh, the, the recent, so there was, there was some trade um, uh, tariffs and retaliatory tariffs from China, and so the USDA has been tasked to um, provide some assistance to U.S. producers and, and U.S. ag industry uh, in terms of promoting trade. Uh, some, some is going to be a direct assistance to producers, and some is going to be for programs that are intended to promote trade to other countries. And uh, cheese has been one of the, uh, a major export item for the United States. And so uh, if these promotional programs really focus on some of those items, we can potentially get, get a boost in cheese production and cheese marketing outside of the United States. So th that, that could certainly be uh, a benefit of, of that marketing program. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, and for the Gallatin Valley, we're kind of like the last real dairy producing area in the state. So I'm sure they're happy to hear some movement in those areas. Uh, Mary from Fairfield, they have some wheat with black seeds. Mm in their wheat. Um, can they plant it? What, what do you think the disease is that's causing that? So there's a few things that can happen to cause discoloration of the seed. Um, one of those is just sooty mold. If they harvested late and had some moisture, that can discolor the seed. And we also get um, one end of the seed turns black. And those are fine to plant. Um, there's smuts and bunts, which will actually replace the seed with the, you know, the pathogen and those you can use a seed treatment and you can plant those. Um, ergot is the last one and you cannot, you know, at very, very, very low levels you can feed it to cattle. It's 0.01% is the mm -hmm. threshold. So you want to get that one. If you think it might be ergot diagnosed and it tends to be a black rind in a white center. A little longer. Yeah, than sometimes a, a little longer, yeah. but with wheat and barley it tends to be about the same size mm -hmm. as the grain. Uh, and feel free to get it sent, send it to us and we can look at it. Um, and that one, again, you can plant, but you're introducing the inoculum. And so if you do choose to plant it, clean the seed to get rid of as much as possible and make sure you don't leave any on the surface. So if you bury it, it it's fine. It won't infect the plant. And it tends to come in from the um, ditches, so just mow the ditches before they flower and mm -hmm. hopefully that'll take care of most of it. Okay, great. Um, Toby from Woods Bay, you have said in the past, oh boy, <laughs> so here your we past go. is coming back <laughs> to haunt you. It always does. <laughs> to use corrugated cardboard around apple trees to keep down coddling moss, but you didn't say if you wrap the trunks or place it on the ground around the tree. 
How do you use that corrugated cardboard? So what you're actually doing is you're putting, uh, and Laurie could probably answer this too, you're putting the corrugated cardboard around the tree uh, to protect the trunk from the tangle foot that you would put around uh, so that the coddling moth can't move up and down. Is that correct? Well, or? you're also mimicking the bark because they will they will overwinter in the bark, so you're giving them little little cubby holes to to cool. over, yeah to spend some spend some time. So <laughs> it's a, it's it's a yeah a, a double factor there introducing the tangle foot and yeah mimicking the bark. Spending some quality time in cardboard. And then like also protects against sun scald. And yeah, I mean, most of the time, if I'm talking about wrapping a tree, it's usually about sun scald. And so you would mm -hmm. put something around there to protect the trunk from, uh, from basically, uh, it would be a desiccation or uh, that you would have from, from sun lower in the horizon. So that's normally what I've been talking about, but not necessarily for coddling moth. So I didn't know that. That's great to, mm -hmm. great to know and also protecting against the deer. Yes, yeah. Yeah, cardboard might not be quite robust enough to protect for deer on Probably the not, uh, and the cardboard will, will wear away with weather. So uh, I actually had corrugated, um, uh, it's like a drain tile that has a slit mm -hmm. that goes through it, and uh, I had that on trees out at the Hort Farm, and a deer got in, and I lost three mm -hmm. trees by really? rubbing literally through that. Oh, I've used trunk, that same so. stuff in the past. Yeah, yeah. yeah so um, it works, but not all the time. Yeah, sometimes those deer are even more persistent. <laughs> yeah, they're they're worse than rats. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they really are. <laughs> Unless they're where you can shoot them. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. When they're Anybody, in town, I'll yeah. give you my cell phone number if you have something you need to get rid of. Uh, <laughs> I also wanted to mention too that since people are, are probably either uh, picking their apples or uh, taking their apples in for cider, especially around the valley here, that that you're probably going to start to see a lot of bruising or see damage from the coddling moth. And they're, they're right now they're not in the apples, um, but but uh, the, you're starting to see damage. Um, you know, kind of the, the typical coddling moth like frass, uh, which is insect excrement on the outside, and then you cut them open and there's nothing in there. Um, but you know, some of those early apples that fall uh, in in the middle of the summer, they they will be in there. But right now they're they're overwintering and in the bark, mm -hmm. but that's, a lot of people are starting to, to see, see damage from coddling moth. Yeah, I was just going to ask, where are they now? They're in the bark? They're in the bark, and, and uh, yeah, they're overwintering. It's somewhere on the tree. Mm -hmm. Is there any mid way to get rid of them to spray them now, or is it kind of futile to try to get them as like a, a horticultural oil or, or something? Right, like a dormant oil? A dormant oil. I don't, I don't know if that's been suggested as a, I don't know if now is a good time at mm -hmm. all, but so. It's usually just following the degree days and kind of early on for the first generation. And get them the in the spring damaging. when they emerge. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah it's a really bad uh, this year in the Gallatin Valley. I, I picked all my apples in my tree and I was very excited until I saw lots and lots of coddling moth damage. So mm -hmm. now they're all getting squished instead of made into apple pie. <laughs> Bummer. Well, maybe next year will be your apple pie yeah, year. I hope so. <laughs> it's always next year. Um, uh, here's a, another potato question from Bozeman. Um, how do you store 50 pounds of potatoes over the winter for, co for consumption? Well, there are multiple things that are important for storing potatoes. Um, the very most important is to keep them out of the light. If you leave potatoes in light, they will turn green and they will actually produce a toxin that is associated with that green color and they also are really bitter and aren't very good to eat. So um, they need to be stored in the dark and in as cool of a place as you have without freezing. Um, if you keep them really, really cold, they'll actually produce sugars in the potato and when you cook them, like if you fry them and make french fries, that's how you get your nice, nice dark brown french fries. Um, commercial potatoes are generally stored um, 40, around 45, 48 degrees um, to keep those reducing sugars from forming, but our seed potato producers actually store those, those at about 38. So if you eat at the local restaurants um, that serve um, potatoes that come from our farmers, a lot of times you do have a little bit more color mm -hmm. <laughs> in your french fries like you do at Five Guys because they also are potatoes that have been stored a little bit colder, so you mm -hmm. get a little bit more color. Um, but um, if you don't mind that, you can store them colder, but if you can store them between 40, 45, or between 40 and 50 degrees in a nice dark place, that's, that's the best. So, okay, Lori, I'm going to give you the opportunity to do a show and tell. Okay. So I was talking a little bit about areified mites before, and I just wanted to show this because uh, um, some people like me might be out doing some early raking. <laughs> so you're going to start to see some some uh, some some damage on your leaves, and this is from these are called finger gall mites. This is from a choke cherry, and if you look 
close up to them, they they actually look like like small little fingers. And um, and the, the mites are actually they're gone right now. They're overwintering under the the leaf buds. But um, but this is just more of a cosmetic thing uh, and nothing that you really have to worry about. But it looks pretty alarming when you when you've seen it on on your trees. And these aerified mites aerified mites are on several different hosts and and they cause lots of different types of galls, finger galls. Um, they they do um, these iridium galls look like sand. And um, they do, you know, lots of different types of shapes of galls, and, and uh, we're just seeing them on a lot of our woody ornamentals. So, okay, thank you, um, Anton uh, from Lewistown. Um, there's a lot of information in the news right now about soybean tariffs, and nothing has been talked specifically about tariffs against small grains. Um, any of the things that we're really producing in Montana, are there any indirect effects on the wheat market and some of our other commodities? Uh, the short answer is, is yes. Uh, agricultural markets are tied together, and uh, the, the decrease in the demand for, for soybeans, basically China, our, our biggest uh, importer of U.S. soybeans, has basically said we're not going to buy any more soybeans. And so we have, uh, and we've had a really good soybean production year, so uh, soybean prices have, have tanked quite a bit, and other markets have followed suit, although wheat, uh, not as much, uh, because of some of the reasons that, I, that I've talked about, uh, we're still looking at Russia. That they're a big exporter that that might not uh, that might close some of their exports. Uh, Montana is to some extent also a bit insulated because we produce a higher quality wheat, and so what, what that means that there's a premium for that, and there's also uh, always a deficit of high quality wheat in the world, and and to some extent Montana small grains are protected from that. We will, we've also had in the past 20 years, some entry of Asian firms who have built and have taken, have, have uh, bought over some of the grain elevators, and that's that's created this this vertically integrated supply chain in Montana. That, that's also been helping out the fact that um, you know we grow a high quality wheat that those Asian countries are depending on. Uh, some of the things. Uh, so the latest set of retaliatory tariffs by, by China, they have placed a 10% uh, tariff on wheat, and so that, that's likely going to impact wheat markets as a whole. Uh, it, it's a wait and see situation uh, of, of how much wheat markets in Montana are going to be impacted. The biggest tariffs that, are, that have been placed, and this is from actually November and December of last year, are the Indian tariffs that were placed on post crops, the mm -hmm. 50 to 60 percent tariffs that, are, that have been placed by India on um, peas and lentils and chickpeas, uh, as well as, so Europe also imports some of the higher quality chickpeas from Montana, and because some of the trade negotiations going on with Europe, that market has also been a bit depressed. What is going to happen with India is, uh, again, th that's a really tough situation uh, to, to foretell about because if they have a really bad growing season, they're going to open up their imports again. Mm -hmm. they're, uh, they're a big produce, uh, consumer of, of those pulse crops, and you know, next year we might see a huge increase in the demand for, for Montana pulse crops back into India. Right now, though, th there's, a, there's quite a bit of a tariff, and Canada has had a, a, a high production year of post crops, and so mm -hmm. that's really depressed uh, post, post uh, prices quite a bit. Um, so, it, again, it, it's really hard to tell. I think in, in a month or two, once the harvest conditions kind of settle down, we'll be able to see we'll, we'll be able to see a, a better picture of what the marketing year is going to look like in the next nine to ten months. Uh, so it's my, my understanding that chickpeas are like half domestic consumption, so do we think we're going to see more chickpea acres next year? Uh, there's, there's, uh, yeah, ch chickpea prices were the only ones that kind of escaped the real drastic decrease in uh, pulse prices in the past there's year. There's some really good diseases on chickpeas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think producers will, will continue to plant chickpeas and help you out with your research. And keep Mary in a job. Right, right. <laughs> Give Mary that's something right. to do. Right. But that, you, you bring up a really great point. One of the uh, the long-term implications of some, of some of these Indian tariffs is I think more of, a, of an outlook for potentially developing domestic industry for pulse crops, and especially the processing of pulse crops. And, and if, 
there's a lot of optimism about that in po the, the, pulse, mm -hmm. the pulse industry. And if that happens, I think we're going to see a, a much more consistent increase. And, and just the protein source? With, yeah. yeah. I, there, there's, um, there's this um, this effort by Canada and the United States called the Protein Highway. Uh, and this is an effort that is, uh, it, its goal is to increase the crop-based proteins production and processing and consumption in the United States and in North America as a whole. And uh, I think as that effort continues and as the production uh, supply chain continues to be stable, <laughs> I think we're going to see domestic processing and, and consumption and developing of those markets really take off. I think we're we're still in the infancy of that, but I, I think we're moving in the right direction. The number of chickpea, pea, and lentil snacks we get at the meetings has yes. just exploded. Yes. <laughs> it is. It is. I even heard that there's like a new chickpea puff oh, that yeah, you yeah. can buy that's kind of a lot like a Cheeto or something like yeah, that. Yeah, they're really so, good. I mean, all of them are. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have to check that one out. Yeah. yeah, I was yeah. just at the gas station uh, um, traveling through Montana, you know, as we do. Uh, <laughs> as we and, do, yes. Uh, you know, starving, trying to find something to eat. <laughs> and, and I did see there was like chickpea stuff at the gas station. I don't, can't mm -hmm. remember if they were chips or puffs or whatever, but I was pretty surprised by that. Did you pick them up, Toby? I did not, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, we won't ask you what you did. Pick up. So, um, so um, Mary, I know that we're actually quite privileged to have you here tonight because you are on sabbatical. I am. And can you tell us a little bit about what you are doing now on your sabbatical, sabbatical, and what you're going to be doing in January? Yeah. So I am currently working on the APS American Phytopathological Society Compendium of Pea Diseases and Pests. So I'm editing that, so I'm collecting chapters and images. I'm also learning statistical software because in January, we're, my family and I are going to Australia. And we are going to be working um, at the South Australia Research and Development Institute on spore trapping networks. So collecting spores and trying to predict plant disease onset. And I was told by one of my collaborators that one of my duties is going to be driving through vineyards. <laughs> there you go. Collecting powdery mildew to monitor for fungicide resistance. So <laughs> learning about all these tools and how we could possibly deploy them here. I know they have a spore trapping network in Idaho that we can learn from as well. And, and these tend to be um, put into effect in higher value crops. Mm -hmm. um, but if we could use that to monitor for head, head scab or you know mm -hmm. something like that and see, see how useful that they are going to be to us and if we can successfully deploy them and we work with our research centers mm -hmm. okay. on getting some of these tools in the hands of farmers. Since you mentioned powdery mildew on grape, I'm going to use this as an opportunity <laughs> for a follow-up <laughs> question because we had one, a question come in from OMAC Washington and they say, yes, I do receive Montana PBS on satellite and that's how I <laughs> So, um, so thank you, Washington, for your interest in our program. So um, this year my grapes got powdery mildew, which ruined most of the grapes. I've never had this problem before. By the time I realized there was a problem, it was too hot to use sulfur. What should I do next year? I would be suspicious that it was not powdery mildew if it was powdery hot. Powdery mildew doesn't really kill grapes. No, I, I yeah. would... Um, they could even probably collect some of those bunches and send them to the diagnostic lab in mm -hmm. in Washington, and they could look for botrytis. They're really good there. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, so we're really good here, but yeah. you probably got people that are working on grapes and there. They, yeah, so. they're, just, they're just fabulous people. I yeah. mean, visited their clinic a few months ago, and. Uh, yeah, I would just send in a sample and they could probably look for other diseases and pests and you could discuss it with them and their their extension agronomist Michelle Moyer is great as well. Right, right. And also, I mean, if you are going to use something like sulfur, it's better to start in a more preventative right. type way and start before you actually anticipate so seeing it. So start with then... accurate identification and then proceed from there. Very good. Um, Toby from Park City. Um, this person had their lawn sprayed with fertilizer and herbicide about three weeks ago, then they had a good rain. When she fall mows, can she use the clippings as mulch in her flower bed? <laughs> um, it depends on the flower bed. So what they probably used as a product for killing uh, um, whatever weeds were in there was probably either like dicamba or 2,4-D. Uh, there's not a lot of products that are that even commercial use that sticks around for a long time. Most, uh, most of those weed killers, three months, and it's not an issue. Mm -hmm. So if you were putting them around your perennials, those probably will break down by the time, as long as those perennials are dormant. 
that's the issue. If you have it, are putting them around your um, annual beds, well, obviously those are going to be gone. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, you just got to be a little bit careful about that. Um, but that's that's that kind of time frame that I always give is about three months before mm -hmm. I would put those around any of your plants, especially anything that's. Uh, that's um, a broadleaf plant, but you could definitely put it around things like iris or lilies or mm -hmm. things like that because right. they're all monocots and won't be affected sure. by it. Okay, thank you, Toby. Um, Lori from Florence, how can you control slugs in the vegetable garden? She's having a, trick, a particularly bad infestation in her beets. Hmm. Yeah, for slugs, um, I think everybody talks about the, the common uh, thing that you could do for slugs is using a, a can of beer, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. which, which can work to some degree. But um, but they, they have a lot of products that like um, that that are available on it. And I can't remember what the active ingredients are now, but that you could get at, at the garden store. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say slug off or something like that. But but um, there are some, some products that, that you can use for slugs uh, and then try to keep uh, get, get rid of the places for them to hide. Too. Right, exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. I mean, we all love a lot of organic matter in our garden, but if you have a nice duff around the bases of your plants, that's a great place for slugs to to hide yeah, and they live. They always get into my lettuce because I think it's just so densely yeah, planted. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, because yeah, I always kind of plant mine in wide rows. Mm -hmm. Have, too. You, have yeah. you ever ate one? A slug? A slug. Uh, yeah. No. Probably Unintentionally? Have. No. There's a reason birds don't eat them. They're, They're nasty. So gross. <laughs> Because every once in a while I get them into strawberries, and I grow, you know, I grow strawberries in my house, and sometimes you don't see them. And you're like, mm, oh, and then uh, it, it is, yeah. it is quite possibly the worst tasting thing I've had <laughs> in a long time. Yeah, I was gonna go back to the beets though. If you um, spread the beets out a little bit, so make your rows wider. wider. So if mm -hmm. they're really close together, and so that they have an environment that's gonna mm -hmm. bring in slugs. The other thing that I would recommend too is that um, I usually see slugs in situations where they've been watered too frequently. So in your vegetable garden with your beets, you could probably get away with watering those every six to eight days wow. instead mm -hmm. of every other day, which mm -hmm. is, I don't know what's going on in that situation. But if you're watering it um, regularly, you're going to create an environment for those slugs. So I've learned. Would drip work better than overhead? A drip would work a lot better, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, but I, I find that, you know, even six to ten days on beets would probably be plenty of water. Everything in my garden pretty much gets <laughs> <laughs> so the same schedule of water. Actually, but what yeah. we do is crops that need a little bit more water, we do drip, and so we'll put two drip tubes down the row mm -hmm. rather than one drip tube, and that's how we control the amount of water. But yeah, it's all on the But you the still get schedule. slugs? Not so much in the vegetable garden. Mm -hmm. a, a little bit in the lettuce, like you said, but like right now on the edges of my flower beds coming out on my sidewalks, mm -hmm. there are just slugs Ooh. all uh, over with this rain, yeah. kind of like worms do in the spring. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, gross. Just kind of mm. gross. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, Anton from Great Falls with the new NAFTA, um, why couldn't they have gotten country of origin labeling to highlight our superior agricultural products? I think there's, there's been uh, quite a bit of uh, controversy with country of origin labeling. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's so it's, it's difficult to. Um, go and, and try to renegotiate a policy that has been in effect, that, that's now not in effect, and now we want to go back into effect. Um, what has been done is the, and, and, and I think what's been very beneficial if, if and when this new policy gets, get, gets approved by Congress, uh, is, is this uh, ability for Montana grain producers to ship their grain to Canada and not have their wheat immediately graded as feed wheat, mm -hmm. which has been the case for numerous decades going back. And, and this has been related to the fact that Canada only accepts wheat at their elevators and doesn't grade them as feed wheat immediately if it is a seed that has been approved by the Canadian's Grain Commission. Mm -hmm. And that has been an issue because we grow pretty good wheat here mm -hmm. and if we send it over there just across the border and it's sold in a Canadian elevator it's going to be immediately you know priced down 30 35 40 percent so, so that mean like a list of varieties that they accept or right yeah okay. and they have an approved list of varieties and if it's not approved it's not going to be accepted there mm -hmm. and one of the things that uh, has been included in this new US Mexico Canada agreement is that that is going to go away, that, that wheat is going to be now graded on its quality, not necessarily on 
the fact that where it's grown. Uh, mm -hmm. And so th that's, that's a type of country of origin labeling that is a good thing for us that it's not going to be labeled U.S. wheat. Uh, it's mm -hmm. just wheat, and, and then it's graded on quality. Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, Mary from Dillon. Um, this is kind of a two-stage question, and Toby, you can chime in um, if you've got additional information. Um, this person has three older apple trees, and they have smaller branches that are dying. Should they trim them now or wait until after a hard freeze? And then their follow-up question, I think they're thinking that this is fire blight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so I guess, like, when and how to prune, and then also, um, do you have any recommendations for fire blight resistant large fruit apples? Well, I'll take the disease portion. I, that's what I figured. I figured we'll, we'll rely on do Toby for the varieties. I thought that made good sense. So, so. you want, if you think it's fire blight, it, it tends to have a really typical shepherd's crooking at the end of the, the mm -hmm. leaf, and then if you, or the stem, and if you peel back some of the affected tissue, there's a staining, like a brown staining, and you can see that pretty easily if you shave it off. You want to prune them when they're dormant. You want to prune two to three inches beyond where you see that staining, mm -hmm. and you want to sanitize your pruner between every cut if you can, mm -hmm. and that is pretty critical. And don't like just dip it like you gotta, you know, clean it. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't know what you recommend for sanitation. Um, on well, I usually go six inches. I mean, okay. I just want to make sure that I don't cut into so basal oh, pruning. Blind. That's what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> six inches. That's off usually the after five or six years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and the, and the thing that's interesting too is that uh, you can go to your extension agent and find out whether or not it is in fact fire blight. We have seen a lot of apple trees that are suspect to something that uh, happened this year, whether or not it was just a frost. Whether or not it was what we call blossom blast, which is a, a pseudomonas. pseudomonas. Um, and I know one of the reasons why I say that is that I have a sweet 16 in my yard that has a couple of strikes that looks like fire blight. But sweet 16 is really resistant to fire blight. And it was fairly cold here in the valley when it was raining mm -hmm. during the time of flowering. So yeah. it makes me really think that it's not. Mm -hmm. um, so let's go to the cultivars. There's uh, a monk guide that we have uh, at MSU, a disease resistant. Um, I think, didn't you write that? Yeah, yeah I actually, yeah. <laughs> I actually did. Yeah, so. I can't remember the names of the varieties. That was, well, that, a, that was another um, career ago. Yeah. So. yeah, so there's there's a lot of great ones out there. I'd encourage you to, to talk with your nursery, but um, things like Goodland, Good Mac, mm -hmm. um, Honey Crisp, uh, Harlson, Harlson Red, mm -hmm. Sweet 16. There's mm -hmm. a bunch of them out there that are that are quite nice. Uh, if you have fire blight, I highly re uh, recommend getting fire blight resistant trees. Because once you get fire blight in your trees, it just seems like you're constantly battling it. Mm -hmm. For sure. So, Lori, I think you've got another show and tell ready for us. Yeah, this is actually, I'll show you the, the bark piece first. This is this is a piece of Douglas fir that came in from the, the Kelly Canyon area in in Bozeman. And then this is what the underside looks like. And these are all galleries from the Douglas fir beetle, which is a bark beetle. And not not always can we see, we, we can see the damage from, from uh, bark beetles, but it's kind of rare that we get to look at the, uh, in the urban environment to get a, a bark sample like this. So uh, the bark beetle actually, they, they form galleries on the inside here. Uh, and then um, and then the beetles will exit the tree and then in the look you can't really see it because the bark's pretty thick but uh, big uh, they look like shot holes and so since we had a bunch of fires in uh, 2017 we were expecting to see a lot of damage from the Douglas fir beetle and also trees that that were very in, in dense stands and, and um, stressed and then also had a lot of damage from the western spruce budworm which is a moth mm -hmm. Uh, we expected to see some damages here. So we are seeing um, some stands that, and the kind of heavily forested areas that are having issues with the, the Douglas fir beetle. So the best thing you could do once you've had, um, you could, you could uh, there are sprays and, um, and there's a patches called uh, NCH patches that you could put on, on your trees that are, that are in good standing uh, to protect them. But once they've, once they've hit your trees, um, they're, they're uh, very hard to, to save them after the bark beetles have come in. So just kind of like the pine beetle then. Yeah. Yep. So I know with the pine beetle, there's like a certain diameter. It has to be like at least eight inches large or something like that in order for the pine beetles to invade and overwinter and 
cause significant problems. Is there anything like that with the Doug fir? That's a good group? question. Yeah, I don't know what the I don't I don't know what the parameters are for invasion, but I know that they they really prefer these these um, you know overgrown dense stands that mm -hmm. are stressed. Sure. Okay, Toby from Kalispell. Um, they started rhubarb a few years ago from a dying plant. The leaves look good, go red and die. What's wrong? Red leaf disease, how to fix? I think we can all talk a lot about this. Yes, yes. So the first thing is, is get good quality plant materials certified if you can mm -hmm. uh, and transplant them somewhere where there was not rhubarb before. Because exactly. it sounds like you got uh, red leaf disease, uh, which is common. Where I see more and more of that. Um, and that's all I can really recommend. Go to your local nursery, get some good plant material. Don't dig it up from somebody else's. And get rid of that one. <laughs> yeah, get rid of that one and don't plant right. it in the same spot. Exactly, Th and I away. think we can say that it kind of goes back to the aspen question. And really any vegetatively propagated plant, you're always better off to start off with new plant material. And like potatoes, don't save your potatoes mm -hmm. and plant them again the next year by do planting stock, mm -hmm. Montana certified seed, of exactly. course. Exactly. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah, so it really goes with everything that's not propagated from a true seed. Yeah, but you're not gonna find Montana rhubarb seed stock uh, <laughs> certified. It's, uh, it's well, not out true. there. Well, that's true, that's true. I always have to plug Montana seed <laughs> potatoes any chance I could get. No, so. but the thing is, is that when you buy the, the rhubarb, make sure that it wasn't just dug up somewhere and put in a pot. Um, I, you know, I think that's a practice that, that I have seen and it's a poor practice. Uh, so ask where it came from, if it came from a certified place, you know, a certified nursery that was growing it. Um, you can get certified rhubarb uh, online and uh, there's, there, are, there are companies that do sell that. So most of the online, if you buy a rhubarb plant, you're probably getting something that's at least disease free. Right. And I, and, uh, or at your local nursery with good products. Thanks. Um, so Anton from Lima, and this is kind of a follow up on the question where you just talked about the country of origin label, labeling, but why do we allow Canadian and Mexican beef into the US and sell it with a US label on it? So there's, <laughs> um, <laughs> There, there are many reasons. Uh, I, I, can, I can give you an example of, of one reason that we import beef uh, and, and then we uh, sell it under a U.S. label. So we produce very high quality beef in the United States. We focus on um, high marbling, high fat characteristics in, in our cattle. And what that provides is really good steaks, right? You go to a steakhouse, mm -hmm. you get U.S. Uh, steak and it's gonna be delicious, it's melt in your mouth. Um, but the, the, the meat that remains that is usually ground up for you know, hamburger meat, it's too fatty, right? Mm -hmm. If you try to sell US only meat in a grocery store, it's gonna have 60% mm -hmm. fat, no consumer is gonna wanna mm -hmm. buy it. So what we do is we import leaner meat that's, that's maybe less high quality for steaks from places like Mexico, from places like uh, Brazil, from Australia, and we use that to mix into our uh, hamburger meat, and then we sell it under, you know, one label. And and when you do that, when you mix uh, those meats together, it becomes very difficult to then say, well, you know, 30% of this came from the U.S., 20 from sure. Canada, <laughs> and you know, some other percentage from Mexico. Uh, so so that becomes very costly. You could certainly mm -hmm. try to do that, but uh, when you ask uh, producers and and uh, you know. Packing uh, firms, whether that that's that's too costly, they're they're going to say yes. And and typically, what, what they're trying to do is um, maximize uh, the 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 benefits for both the consumer and the producers here. And and a lot of times, when when you um, have them label too much, that creates very high costs, which are then passed on to consumers. And so th there, there's a balance, and and a big reason for that uh, non-labeling is the fact that you really can't tell which meat is coming from which which cow. So it's kind of like wine, it has to be so <laughs> real It's low. a blend. That's right. yeah. Yeah. It's a blend. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Right. okay, Mary, um, this is a question from Stevensville, and you are getting this question because you have chickens. <laughs> So, um, this hey, your, they were your chickens. <laughs> they were my chickens, but yeah, you've got them now. So, um, this caller um, uses wood shavings um, in their chicken house, yeah. and then they remove the 
yeah, wood too. shavings mm -hmm. in manure and they're using them for mulch around their trees. Mm -hmm. So is this a good practice? Is there a possibility of introducing any diseases, any problems with using the chicken manure wood shaving mixture as mulch around their trees? So wood shavings can be a source of vascular wilts. Um, I'm not aware of any in pine that are high risk. I know in the Midwest mm -hmm. they've got some like hardwood, the chips. Um, I do it routinely and they're composted with chicken manure. I love using mine because I don't have to use somebody else's compost that might have herbicide residual. Mm -hmm. And so that's been a huge, it, working in the diagnostic lab. <laughs> <laughs> right, you find all of the areas where you can me. get herbicide residual. Yeah, so I use that and then um, we actually have rabbits as well. And that's the only kind of animal waste you can use without composting. Now you know. Oh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Well, and especially when it's mixed with wood shavings yeah. because the carbon in the wood shavings is going to tie I up I find any it perfect. Plus, I put the wood shavings in and then it just decomposes really easy the chickens love tossing it around and uh -huh. yeah it's all good okay very good um, Toby from Hamilton uh, they planted a peach tree this spring and a deer has rubbed the bark off of about a third of the two inch trunk so there is good bark around two thirds in two thirds of the trunk should they take it down now and plant a new in the spring or leave it alone and see if it survives and recovers? I would leave it alone. Um, so you're still going to have enough vascular tissue and two thirds of that trunk to, to be able to sustain that tree. Um, and it should be fine, but this is a, a, a time that you probably just learned uh, to put some kind of either fence out that tree or put some kind of uh, deterrent from those bucks, uh, which will, will be rubbing on that tree again. There's something about the resin on certain trees that, that uh, they really love rubbing their antlers to try to get to darken them sometimes, and that's usually on like pines. Um, but also they'll find certain trees that they like and weirdly enough they kind of come back to some of those yeah. so uh, if they found this it, they may come back. Yeah that's been my experience too it seems like they'll just keep <laughs> year gonna, after year. Yeah, yeah. The, the fact that it's one after a peach tree is it makes me think it's like a Utah uh, deer just because they, they <laughs> migrated up and we're used to peach trees. And, uh, don't see them in Montana. They don't think we should be raising peaches in Montana. <laughs> I haven't it's seen one of those since I was in Utah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Lori from Stevensville. Is there anything that can be done in the fall when aphids and mites go dormant to help control them next year? or alternatively in the early spring? Uh, yeah, actually you can, um, so mites right now, the problems that we have mostly are, are from the aerified mites and, and fruit trees, but um, for mites and aphids, you could do a horticultural oil if you get the right, correct temperatures at this time of year, but you have to make sure that, yeah, the temperatures are right on uh, the next couple of days too. So it's usually above 50 degrees, but just also take a little little sample of, of leaf material and just test it for, if you're gonna apply a horticultural oil to make sure that you don't have any sort of phytotoxicity or you don't burn mm -hmm. any of the leaves. So just do a little patch first. A little patch first, <laughs> yeah. I had that problem with a lot of things. This <laughs> I burned a lot of my leaves, oh. <laughs> left them in the sunlight, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so Anton from Big Fork, um, has anyone done a study on tariffs on wheat, corn, and soybeans? What price should it be? So I don't exactly, I'm not an economist, so I don't okay. know what they're getting <laughs> at there. I think, I, I think, um, and, and I may be wrong, so call in again. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, or I call could, you at your right, office. Right, right, that's right, yeah. or call me. Um, I, I think what, what the question might be referring to is this uh, aid package mm -hmm. that came out that said, well, look, you know, soybeans, we're gonna give you a buck, you know, 30 or something like that per bushel. For corn, you're gonna get a, a penny per bushel. For wheat, you're gonna get 14 cents per bushel. Uh, and, and that came out of the USDA Office of the Chief Economist Office to uh, basically say, look, how much did these Chinese retaliatory tariffs affect the price of the commodity and how much aid should you get? There, there isn't a lot of information of how uh, and what models were used to determine those price decreases. Uh, the information that, that I know is that they only focused on the Chinese tariffs, not all of the indirect impacts that, that 
uh, happened because of, say, Mexico uh, imposing some retaliatory tariffs and uh, Canada and, and the European Union. So I think there's a lot more going on in how these trade negotiations have impacted prices. I don't think that anyone has done an analysis on the current tariffs quite yet, mm -hmm. uh, mostly because they're still in place and they haven't ended yet and we haven't really resolved those trade negotiations. Uh, but what has come out of the USDA has only tried to focus on the Chinese market and the impacts from that Chinese market. And it's it's a bit of a black box. There, there isn't a lot of information out there. And I haven't seen any uh, economists really dig into what's the information that is available and really say this was legitimate or you know there, there's some errors in there. Now, I, I want to I say that that was done very quickly. And I want to give kudos to those economists at the <laughs> Office of the Chief Economist because they had a very tight uh, deadline to meet. So they did their best. You know, it's it, we're going to keep working on on finding out what, what was the right number. Okay, great. So we have about 30 seconds left for you to tell us how are the research centers around the state connected to the Ag Experiment Station? Yeah. So the Ag Experiment Station, every state has one. It's uh, it, it's it's tasked with producing agricultural research that is uh, relevant to that state. So part of that is having research centers that are in the communities of where agriculture is important. And that connects all of the research that's done in Bozeman and at those research centers to the ag communities, having communicating that research to those communities and bringing those questions back to the researchers at those research centers and at Bozeman. So the communication between those research centers and the Bozeman uh, campus, that's the connection. Great, and you get to be the ringmaster. So. <laughs> All right. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of our show. Thank you, panel, for answering a great um, group of questions. Uh, next week, we will have Emily McCage, who will be talking about forage, the backbone of the Montana livestock industry. So thank you all for being here, and we will see you next week on Montana Ag Live. Montana Ag Live is made possible by the Montana Department of Agriculture, the MSU Extension Service, the MSU Ag Experiment Stations of the College of Agriculture, the Montana Wheat and Barley Committee, the Montana Bankers Association, Cashman Nursery and Landscaping, and the Gallatin Gardeners Club.